the afterlife. The first squirt of sunlight hit the window. The bus changed gears. Brent opened his eyes. They were climbing through mountains now. The other passengers around him were sleeping. Twitched alert by the light, he craned his neck to get a better view, pressed his head to the tinted glass, and rapidly observed the sun's rising. After night came another day, and after death came another life. Morning seemed mysterious gifts. He inspected the dawn with fascination. The bus gears growled. Behind him, he heard a faint conversation in another language. This is the afterlife, he told himself, to be crowded in with a collection of strangers plunging through a foreign landscape headed toward an unknown destiny. The bus was his ferry across the river Styx. It descended now into an unlit valley. Brent squinted at his map and realized he was in the Cascades. Seattle wasn't far off. He'd been riding for two days, watching new souls board in Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Minneapolis Fargo, Bozeman, Butte, Coeur d'Alene, and Spokane. He'd speculated on their previous lives. He had surprisingly little interest in his own. His second life had eclipsed his first. Its moment of birth had been the crash. He didn't remember the actual impact. He did recall the ambulance lights, the policeman asking how he felt, the discovery that he'd escaped with only cuts and a minor head injury. And then came the alcohol test, and then the drive to the police station, being booked for drunken driving, the photographs, the fingerprints, registering his new birth, he thought now, and then the realization that the ambulance at the scene had been tending to someone else, that he had hit another car. His father had arrived at the station. There was talk of the Chevy, its back end mangled, the car probably totaled, and then the news delivered by one of the officers that the woman he'd hit had died. The mutinous had begun in that moment. He spoke not at all, driving home with his father, slept 14 hours, and didn't speak the next day. He remembered the party and that he'd tried to kill himself, and that he'd ended up killing someone else left him frozen, numb from scalp to soles. Words returned on the second day. His tur turmoil, though, wasn't translatable into words. His mother got rid of the newspaper that had a story about the crash, but Brent dug it out of the bottom of the trash can. His car had apparently hit a divider, spun, then been struck by the driver behind him. His blood alcohol was a .11. The story was brief and gave only the victim's name, age, and residence. Leah Zamora, 18, Chicago. He plumed these few facts. She was nearly his own age. He was determined to know more. He tried the obituaries, but her name wasn't listed. He rummaged through the trash for the following day's paper, turned the gravy-stained obituaries, and found her. Daughter of Caesar and Tamara Samora, senior at Niles North High School, an honor student, member of the student council, the orchestra, the track team, active in the Filipino community, volunteer at Resurrection Hospital. Why did he have to kill someone like that? And then he realized with a surge of relief that he, had, that he could perhaps go to her funeral. The police had confiscated his license, but he could take a cab, stand in the back, leave an anonymous offering of some kind. He checked the paper. It had been held the day before. He ate little, spoke little, and no longer listened to music. He turned 17, an event he scarcely noticed. He heard his parents whisper about the blow to his head and his personality change. He'd been diagnosed with a mild concussion. The headaches like a wrecking ball working on his skull came less often, replaced by the endless tooling in his mind of the word murderer. Everyone knew. He refused to go to school and made arrangements to finish his class at, classwork at home. He disliked being seen in this neighborhood where the glances he drew were too long or too short. Among strangers, he felt no less an outcast, their blind assumption that he was one of them making him wince inside. He studied their carefree innocence with envy, an old woman re reading on a bench in a mall, a baby sleeping in a stroller, a pretzel seller joking with a customer. He was no longer of their kind and never would be. There was a hearing with a judge soon after the crash. Like a ghost, Brent listened to other people discuss the accident and his fate. He was charged with a DUI, that's driving under the influence, and manslaughter. He hadn't contested his guilt. His punishment was the issue at hand. The judge asked for more information and set a date for a second hearing. It was then that the interviewing began. Social workers and psychologists questioned him, his parents, his friends. He found the fact that he tried to kill himself impossible to share with another soul. He could scarcely believe he'd actually tried it and wondered how he could have given no thought to the other cars that he would hit. 
His parents hired their own lawyer and psychologist. Their job was to argue that sending him to the juvenile detention center would be detrimental to his worrisome mental state. His father tried to cheer him up, promising he would serve no time, telling him to put it behind him, assuring him people would forget. I won't, answered Brent answered silently. He took the obituary from its hiding place, looked up Caesar Zamora in the phone book, and spent all of one day composing what became a four-sentence apology. He mailed it on a Monday. The reply came on Friday. An envelope with his own letter inside, mutilated with scissors, stabbed, and defaced with cigarette burns. Nightmares about Mr. Zamora stalking him through the Philippine jungle joined those about the detention center. Entering the courthouse for his second hearing, the latest dream of being beaten by a circle of inmates reoccurred to him. He passed a young man, his arms swarming with tattoos, whom he was certain he'd seen in his dream. He and his parents found their room. The psychologist spoke, and then the lawyers. Brent suddenly wondered if Mr. Zamora might be there. He was trying to scan the faces to his rear when his father squeezed his forearm. The judge was addressing him, sentencing him to probation in place of the detention center. His parents beamed. He felt relief, but also an unanswered hunger. He realized he wanted a punishment, but he knew also that grim as the detention center might be, he'd have welcomed the chance to leave his family and his previous life behind. The listing of terms of his probation hardly registered with him. Alcohol counseling, therapy for depression, volunteering in an emergency room. And then the judge came to the final item, meeting the victim's family if they desired to discuss restitution. Brent knew the meeting would never take place and the outcome that once again left him relieved and unsatisfied. He wanted to do something for the family. Two days later, the probation officer called. The victim's mother had agreed to talk with him. The meeting was scheduled in a building downtown. Entering, Brent wished his parents weren't with him. The room was spacious and had a view of Lake Michigan. Miss Gill, young, black, soft-voiced, was there to serve as a mediator. A few minutes later, Mrs. Zamora arrived. Not the tiny Asian woman Brent had pictured, but a heavy-set redhead in an India print skirt. Among the dozen necklaces jangling on her chest, Brent picked out pendants of an astrological sign and a Native American sun symbol. Her wavy hair flowed exuberantly over her shoulders. The rest of her seemed only half alive. She navigated the introductions with an eerie, ethereal calm. Brent gazed openly into her face, offering himself to her, and noticed that her eyes were slightly bloodshot. Those eyes searched his own and then released him. How strange, he thought, that he'd somehow caused this woman, whom he'd never met, to cry. We're meeting today, said Miss Gill, to apologize and to understand and to atone. Her voice was hopeful rather than accusing. We never know all the consequences of our acts. They reach into places we can't see and into a future we where no one can. She looked at Brent and then invited Mrs. Samora to describe the results of Leah's death. When the phone rang, she began, I was sorting through lentils to soak for soup the next day. Her voice had a faint flutter to it, her eyes down. She continued the detailed, dispassionate account of that night and the days that followed of her husband smashing a wooden chair in his rage, the younger children's endless crying, her sleeplessness, the thought of killing herself to be with Leah, the voice from Leah's photo saying, no. Brent closed his eyes. What murder's machine had he constructed and set into motion? When his turn finally came to speak, the long apology he'd rehearsed reduced itself to two words, I'm sorry. Words he spoke over and over and then wailed miserably through tears, not caring that his parents were watching. Miss Gill spoke for a while. When it came time to discuss restitution, Brent saw his father shift nervously. The Zamoras hadn't sued. Apparently, they were content with the insurance company's payment. His father brought his checkbook just in case. Brent spied the silver pin beside it in the, his jacket inside pocket, stationed like a butler awaiting command. Miss Gill reviewed various possibilities, a written apology to each family member, service to a charity of the Zamora's choice, service to the Zamora's themselves. Whatever it might be would be agreeable to both parties. Mrs. Zamora stared back at her. I don't believe in retribution. Leah was born in the Philippines. I was teaching English and met my husband there. I saw what an eye for an eye looks like with the rebels fighting the government and all. My husband feels a little differently. I also believe everything happens for a reason. She toyed with her necklaces. That the universe required this for some reason. 
She paused and then directed her words at Brent's parents. Leah had a very caring soul, strong and generous. Everybody who saw her smiled. They loved her at the hospital where she worked. This summer, she was going to do volunteer work in California. In the fall, she was going to college in Boston. She would have spread joy all over the country. Brent wondered what his own eulogy would sound like. Mrs. Amora turned her gaze on him. I've thought about you for hours and hours. What can you possibly do for me? Paint the house, mow the lawn all summer? Her voice had acquired a strong tremble. She let the questions hang in the air and then looked to Brent's left out the window. My father is a fine carpenter. Leah was his first grandchild, and when she was little, he made her lots of wooden toys. Her favorite was a whirly gig of a girl with arms that spin in the wind. He painted the face to look like her. We'd had it on a pole in our yard forever. Hundreds of people over the years have noticed it and stopped and smiled, just like people smiled at Leah. She opened her purse, extracted a photo, looked at it, and passed it to Brent. It showed the wind toy in motion. Leah is gone. I'm learning to accept that. I thought I had nothing that I could ask of you that would help. You can't bring back her body. And then I thought about her spirit. Brent's skin tingled. He stared at the photo and then her anxious to hear her bidding. This is my only request, that you make four whirly gigs of a girl that looks like Leah. You put her name on them and then you set them up in Washington, California, Florida, and Maine, the corners of the United States. Let people all over the country receive joy from her even though she's gone. You make the smiles that she would have made. It's the only thing you can do for me. She exhaled. That's what I ask. You gotta be joking, said Brent's mother. His father strained forward in his chair. This is crazy, he appealed to Miss Gill. That's not the kind of thing you asked for. He, he faced Mrs. Zamora. And how's he supposed to zip around the country in a private jet? She pulled something else out of her purse. I bought him a Greyhound bus pass good for 45 days. He can go anywhere. Miss Gill repeated that restitutions were not imposed but accepted voluntarily by the offender. Brent's parents raised one objection after another from his commitment to the emergency room to his need for his family to his non-existent carpentry skills and the cruel and unusual conditions of bus travel. Brent was oblivious of the argument. In the quiet storm cellar of his mind, he pondered the proposal. Strange as it was, it would get him away from Chicago, his parents, and his recent past. It would also give him a chance to do penance. He'd never traveled on his own. The idea held sudden appeal. He smiled and sighed. He cleared his throat, and then he spoke the words, I'll do it. The bus sped down the cascades like a skier, and then the road flattened. Brent saw a main point. He turned and beheld a peak in the distance that seemed a mirage, impossibly high, snow shimmering on its wide shoulders, the absolute lord of the landscape. The word Rainier passed down the aisle. Brent gawked. It seemed too large, as a full moon does when it first rises into view. He'd never been west of Chicago before. He was sure he was there now. He opened his whirligig book, and he looked through it between glances out the window. He found it in the sixth store he tried, a dingy used bookshop downtown on Wabash Avenue. It was an old, loose-spined hardback called Make Your Own Whirligigs and Weather Vanes. A previous owner had penciled tiny, masculine-looking notes into the margin. Brent wondered where the man was at that moment and tried to imagine him from his handwriting. He saw a balding head and glasses. Strange, he thought, that they would never recognize each other if they met. He flipped ahead to a whirly gig of a man milking a cow. He'd read only the chapter on supplies. He knew he should have tried building one in Chicago, but he hadn't. Once his probation officer had convinced Brent's parents that the trip might help him, he'd been in a rush to leave. He eyed his blue backpack on the rack, and he felt separate from all the other passengers. Their luggage held shirts and pants. His held slabs of plywood, a saw, a hand drill, dowels, brass rods, pliers, a quart of varnish, nails, and paint. He watched his backpack closely, dreading his tools spilling out. He'd probably be accused of making bombs. He imagined replying with the truth that he was the builder of whirly gigs. Why not? No one knew anything about him. Here was a chance not simply to alter his past as he'd done in school, but to actually live in a different life. He tried the words out in his head. I'm a traveling whirly gig maker. It was an interim identity tied to his previous life. He could cast it off soon, but in favor of what? He was lodged in his own chrysalis, but had no idea what he was turning into. They passed through Preston, then Issaquah. The old man next to Brent was still sleeping. 
In 24 hours, they exchanged 10 words. He observed two women in front of him exclaiming over wallet photos and marveled at how naturally some people spun lives of connection, turning a world of strangers into family. He opened his own wallet, took out Leah's picture, <coughs> and studied it in solitude. He found her entrancing. She looked Hawaiian, her skin the color of cinnamon, smooth as sanded wood. Her forehead high, her hair long and straight, her eyes were faintly Asian. He probed the photo of her information and now saw that she'd drawn her hair, skinny black as obsidian, to the side with a clip. Her dress was white, or was it only a blouse? He examined the pattern embroidered on the bodice. She wore a gold necklace, fine as spider silk, but he couldn't see what hung from it. He scrutinized her smile from close range, almost felt her breath on his face. Strange to think she was now smiling at her killer. Yet she wasn't. Her head was turned at an angle. He stared into her cheerful brown eyes, knowing that she would never look back at him, but always off to the side. This was a relief. Her direct gaze would have vaporized him with accusation. He turned the photo over and read her full name, Leah Rosalia Santos Samora, written in her mother's curly cued script. She'd given him the picture as a model for the whirly gigs along with a disposable camera. Strangely, she wanted photos of them but didn't want to know their locations. The idea of coming upon one, she told him, rusted or vandalized or fallen over, lifeless like her daughter, was forbidding. She preferred to see them in her mind where they would spend forever safe from all harm. Suburbs appeared out the window and then the bus nosed its way through a long tunnel and emerged into downtown Seattle. The streets were hilly. Brent glimpsed Puget Sound. He wanted a longer view, but the bus turned following its usual labyrinth path to the station. He glanced at his United States map. Interstate 90 ended here, the same road that led all the way back to Chicago that passed a few miles from his house. He felt himself a departing sailor leaving the sight of land behind. The bus found the station. The brakes sighed. He grabbed his backpack and climbed down. His voice sounded odd in his own ears when he asked for directions to the water. He tightened down his sleeping bag, struggled into his pack, and set off, staggering like a grizzly walking upright. It was early in July and sunny. He sampled the air, amazed at how light it felt so different from the weighted, humid heat he was used to. He followed bustling Stewart Street, viewing the cars and pedestrians curiously. How like the afterlife it all was, a populous city reached only after a long journey toward the setting sun, here all along but never seen until now. Was Leah here somewhere? Walking on, he jerked at the sight of a face vaguely resembling hers and then arrived at the tourist-thronged Pike Place Market. He passed up the chance for a squid burger, bought two hot dogs instead, and watched a juggler while he ate. The crowds bothered him. It felt more like Chicago than the pristine Pacific Northwest he'd heard of. He left following signs to Waterfront Park. This turned out to be the pier's amusements. He looked over the water, a line of blue mountains, floated above the clouds into the distance. That was the Washington that he wanted. Leah's mother hadn't specified where in the four states he should put the whirly gigs. He bought a map, some groceries, walked back to the station, and took the next bus north. He got off in Mount Vernon and poured over his map. He broke his promise to the parents not to hitchhike, found a ride with a fisherman heading west, and then walked three miles to a state park on the water only to find that the campground was full. He hadn't realized it was Fourth of July weekend. Seeing that he'd walked, the ranger suggested he try asking if he could share a site. Slowly, Brent meandered through the campground. Every site was a separate country, baseball blaring from a radio in one, while the next was occupied by a couple playing duets on the soprano recorders. It struck him that every family was a universe with its own peculiar natural laws. Free of his own family, he imagined himself part of each one that he passed, trying on identities like quick change artists. He neared the end of the campground. He paused, stealthily eyeing a bearded man, unloading his tent for a bicycle. It was a tall fit, looked to be in his 30s, had a thoughtful sunburned face. The man noticed him, stopped, and turned. Brent felt like a stray dog begging for scraps. I, I, I was wondering, his voice was rusted from disuse. He cleared his throat. If you'd mind, if you picked out a corner for yourself, be my guest. I'll pay half the fee, Brent added quickly. Oh, no need. I'm glad to have the company. The sight was on the water and more private than most. Brent was pleased. He took off his pack, pried off his sneakers, waded up into his calves, and washed his face in Puget Sound. It was too late to begin on the whirly gig. He pulled out his tent, an open tube of plastic meant to hang from a rope strung between two trees. He'd been sent to a camp for a week a few times, but not lately, and had never camped out on his own. He stood with his rope, unable to find flat ground furnished with properly spaced trees. He hoped the cyclist wasn't watching him and saw the, man, the man's dome tent suddenly spring up like a magician's illusion. 
Brent scanned the sky. It didn't look like rain. He put the tent back and unrolled his sleeping bag. And what brings you here? The cyclist asked over dinner. They collaborated on a fire. Brent stirred his pan in beef barley soup. I'm just seeing the country, he answered offhandedly. What about you? I'm riding south from Canada, heading down the coast to San Francisco, seeing the country like yourself, studying the strange customs of the natives. No offense meant. Where are you from? Prince George, British Columbia, halfway up toward the Rainier. The name raised visions of the far north in Brent's mind. He never met a Canadian before. He felt like an explorer who just heard um, the unknown continent. Ever play Go, the man asked. The game, never heard of it. Like to learn? After dinner, the cyclist produced a folding board and two tiny boxes of stones, black and white. It's from China originally, like most things. I'm still learning myself. Brought a book about it to study on the trip. He gave Brent the white stone shaped like flying saucers, polished and identical. It's supposed to be excellent training for generals. Some say it won the Vietnam War for the North, Wheaties for the brain. He explained the rules and they began a practice game. The object was to secure territory, arranging groups of stones into living communities that couldn't be extinguished by your opponent. Brent felt like he was practicing constructing his new life. Out of nowhere, the word cross came to his mind. From the Von Gott book he read in English, a term for a disparate group of people linked together without their knowledge. Your family and friends were not part of your cross. You couldn't choose its membership. It might never know who was in it or what its purpose was. Brent felt certain that Leah was a member of his. Was the cyclist part of it too? Sunset flared orange on the water. Firecrackers began going off. Ah, yes, said the man. Noise-making devices to dispel evil spirits on this important day. Brent couldn't reveal why he shared the same distance perspective. The second time around, he saw everything from the outside. Much that he'd taken for granted before now struck him as curious. Handshaking, the Pledge of Allegiance, neckties on men, sports teams named for animals. The sky shifted to shades from the spectrum's outer edges and then went black. The cyclist lit tiny gas lamps that hissed and glowed like shards from a star. But its light, they played another hour and then retired. Brent climbed into his sleeping bag. Radios, firecrackers, voices subsided, replaced by the churring of crickets, a breeze's passage through the trees, the waves, steady respiration. The non-human world was emerging, a world he'd rarely noticed, another hidden city. Was Leah now a citizen here? He wondered if the creature he heard creeping over dry leaves could be her. He imagined her fully fluent here, able to hear and comprehend what he couldn't. Her sense of smell greed greatly magnified this bit of shoreline known to her as it never would be to him. He looked up at the stars, glinting silently, a movie without a soundtrack, or was he simply deaf to their music? He realized he knew no constellations, likewise the names of trees, flowers, rocks, birds, insects, and fish. He was a foreigner here. He wished he knew some names. When he awoke, the cyclist was leaving. It was cold. Brent's bag was damp with dew. Huddling within, waiting for the sun to drop the tree, to top the trees and warm the world, he understood why people had worshipped it. Two hours later, he took a shower, breakfasted on French bread and cheese, skimmed three chapters of the World Get Good Book, and picked the simplest project offered, an angel whose spinning arms played a harp. He studied the diagrams apprehensively. Neither he nor his father was the popular mechanics type. There were practically no tools in his house. Those he'd brought with him had all been bought new. It had been four years since he'd taken woodshop, where he'd spent weeks on a simple hinged top box. Maybe he'd change in that time. He felt Lee and Mrs. Amora watching him and hoped that he had. He walked to his pack. He'd bought four pieces of plywood, one foot by two feet, marine grade, half an inch thick. He drew out one sat at the table and sketched the angel's outline on it and then erased it all freehand drawing was none not his forte either it took half an hour to get right he tightened the wood down to the table with a clamp started in with his d-shaped coping copping saw and promptly broke the thin blade he inserted the only spare he'd brought feeling like a soldier down to his last bullet he worked gingerly. The blade survived. The file that followed the same path not only smoothed the wood's edge, but snapped off a sizable chunk of the angel's wing. He slammed the file onto the table. He hated wood. He took a break, frightened by his anger in the face of the setback. There was no channel changer here. He picked up the whirly gig book and stared at the previous owner's patent precise script. He almost felt the man was with him, telling him to settle down and conquer the project calmly, step by step. 
He sat down. He decided to do without the wing. The figure could simply be a harp player. The harp was full size, the sort you'd find in an orchestra. Leah had played in an orchestra. He wondered what his instrument was. He s- he wondered what her instrument was. He sawed off the rest of the wing, sanded the wood, and then went to his pack and dug out his five tubes of acrylic paint. In the trash can, he found a styrofoam cup, which he filled with water for cleaning his brushes. From the same source, he retrieved a paper plate to use as a palette. He painted one side of the figure, let it dry a bit, and then leaned it on a stone, painted the other, making her hair black rather than yellow, prescribed by the book. Down one side he printed Leah's name with a black permanent marker and then used it and his tape measure to draw her harp strings. He considered his work. It, was perf- it wasn't perfect, especially the outline of the face. It looked nothing like her. He repainted the mouth but only made matters worse. The two sides should have been identical, but they weren't. It was the best he could do. He stopped and ate lunch. All afternoon was spent on Leah's propeller-shaped arms. He began referring to the whirly gig by her name and almost felt he was resembling, reassembling her broken body, reviving her. Each arm required much whittling and sandling. Suddenly, he was halted by the strangeness of the task. He saw it as his parents' hand had. Why am I doing this? He said aloud. The whole enterprise seemed taken from a dream, incomprehensible in the light of day. He returned to work. What he knew without question was that it felt good to be busy tooling in atonement, to direct his feelings outward through his arms and knife as if draining an abscess. Now and then his eyes crossed Puget Sound to the Olympic range and settled on the peak the cyclist had told him was Mount Olympus, the home of the Greek gods, Brent mused. Hadn't Hercules likewise performed his labors to cleanse himself of a crime? In, from Miss Lofton's class in a previous life, the story returned to him while he worked of the Greek hero slaying his wife and children in a fit of insanity, his asking an oracle how he could atone, her telling him to seek out a certain king and perform for him twelve labors. His tasks had been just as bizarre as Brent's and likewise had called for long journeys. Brent worked until late. He cut his hand three different times and suspected that part of him wasn't content with the labors he'd been assigned and longed to met out more punishment. He laid out the whirly gig's various parts um, and set them shining with a thick coat of varnish. Leah's eyes glistened as if she'd awaken. Finally, he put down the tools, built a fire, and warmed another can of soup. He returned to work early the next morning, bent over his book like a biblical scholar, mumbling, rereading, receiving sudden insights. He carefully mounted the arms on the figure. The placement was tricky. He tried to figure out why one arm didn't spin and adjusted it endlessly. Next, he agonized over the figure's pivot point, marked the spot, drilled the hole, and hoped for the best. He pounded some tubing into the hole. He slipped this over a piece of dowel. The figure turned smoothly from side to side. He glued the dowel into a chunk of two by four he had found along the shore. He tingled. He realized he was finished. He blew upon it, the arms pinwheeled, seeming to strum like a harp string. He could hardly believe it actually worked. He blew 50 more times for confirmation. He now wondered where to set it up. Was it illegal to mount it on state land? Then again, the park belonged to the public. Better here than in someone's front yard. He'd have to hope the harpist so charmed the rangers that they wouldn't remove it. How to mount it was a further problem. He hadn't brought 10-foot poles in the pack. He paced the site, deliberating, and then he spied a tree limb roughly horizontal, open to the wind from the west and high enough to keep his work out of reach. He climbed out, nailed it down, the drift, nailed down the driftwood mount, and then he returned for the whirly gig. Back on ground, he stared up at it. The harp player was just over a foot tall and seemed much smaller from a distance. Brent awaited a breeze until his neck ached. When it came, the figure felt it first. It swung on the dowel like a weather vane. The arms lifted, then trembled, then spun. He felt the breeze. The arms gained speed. The, his smile widened. The phrase, the breath of life, traveling through his mind. He watched, mesmerized, and then he ran for his camera.